Arme, this is your pal Mark, editor of XFL News Hub, on location or on a little vacation here in sunny Florida, as I'm like squinting and can barely see. Um, but I just wanted to check in. We had a great interview. Our own Mike Mitchell was on the drive in Canada, and I thought, hey, this would be a really good. He gave dropped a bunch of hints and stuff that's going on between the XFL and CFL, and I was like, man, fans have got to hear this. So uh, that's going to be this week's little quick podcast. So you got Mike Mitchell, our own XFL insider, on the drive in Canada talking about the XFL. They asked some great questions, and so check it out. And uh, we'll see you in a little bit. Enjoy your time with your family. I'm enjoying mine with a little vacation because when we get back, it's go time for the CFL, CFL News Hub, and hopefully we'll get some news from the XFL as well. So take care and check out Mike Mitchell on the drive. We bring on Mike Mitchell from XFL News Hub, CFL News Hub, uh, articles featured in Bleacher Report, and uh, is in the know when it comes to uh, the CFL and the XFL. Uh, good afternoon, Mike. How are you? Hey, good afternoon. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for having me on. Yeah, great to have you on, Mike. I uh, really appreciate the time. And, uh, you know, I've been reading your articles here uh, for the last few weeks, and I've kind of felt that of all the people that uh, that have covered the XFL, that you seem to have, uh, you know, a lot of the best information. So, uh, you know, just from your standpoint, what – Give us your take about what you've seen and heard so far about, you know, the possibility of a merger or some sort of partnership involving the two leagues. You know, a a lot of people don't like this answer, but, you know, it's the truth right now. You know, people, uh, people have the assumption that there's already, everything's already been settled. Everything's already been finalized. It's just a matter of them telling us when they're ready to, but from everything that I've heard, um, the focus is on the business side first, and they haven't even gotten to the point yet where you can even think about all the other stuff, all the fun stuff, or depending on what side of the argument you're on, all the scary stuff in terms of merging two leagues and all that. Right now, what they're trying to do, or what they've been trying to do for quite some time, both leagues, is trying to figure out the a merger of their businesses, how that can work and how they can do that. And they've narrowed down their options, but they haven't really for lack of a better term, put the keys in the ignition. And uh, they're not ready to go yet, which a lot of people don't want to hear that, but that's really the reality of it. I think what they have planned on a grand scale globally is it's going to be difficult to achieve. How You know, when you have two separate ownership structures, you have to figure out how you're going to share in profits, in um, business deals, in, in rights deals, all that, uh, so everything that entails. So, um it's not sexy. Everybody wants to hear immediately um, what's going to happen. When are they going to start? All that. Um, if anything happens, if um, it's probably we're probably not going to hear something until later on this year. Maybe until the CFL season ends. And if these two leagues or two entities come together, I don't think it's going to happen until 2023. That's from everything that I've heard. And in reading what you've been. Uh, putting out there. Tell us a little bit about uh, BCG, the Boston Consulting Group, and, you know, looks like a consulting firm trying to help out with these talks so that, you know, these two businesses can come together, but there's non-disclosure agreements and everything else. So, you know, it obviously looks like this, you know, the two groups need some help to be able to do this. Yeah, you know, it's interesting about the whole BCG thing is, quite frankly, to be forthcoming here, I have a lot of conversations with uh, people who are up the ladder on an off-the-record basis. So I heard about BCG's name, and then in May, Danny Garcia kind of let the cat out of the bag with that. But I was surprised that it really didn't, there wasn't much traction on it. And from what I've heard, I did some follow-up on it since it's out there. And the information that I got was that BCG was not only helping the XFL, but was also helping the CFL in these talks as almost um, as a mediator, someone giving... Uh, so, you know, because that's the p- position that these consulting firms are in. If they give advice, uh, solutions, offer up strategies, you know, to try to help, uh, you know, companies figure out what the best course is moving forward. So um, they've been involved in the, the process. They have a very good reputation, very prestigious, obviously, uh, firm in uh, BCG. So uh, there's some big people involved. I mean, Redbird, if people do the research on Redbird Capital, they can see all the tentacles they have, the reach they have throughout the sports world and everything else. And then obviously The Rock and Danny Garcia and the CFO. 
NFL. So, um, yeah, there's there's big talks. These it's a grand plan. It's not whatever they're planning, whatever they end up agreeing to do moving forward together. It's going to be something on a grand scale. It's uh, you know with streaming involved, Netflix potentially, or streaming service involved, um, expansion of the games and where they where they are aired and all that. So. It's, there's a lot of moving parts, and it's not an easy thing to pull off. And they're taking a very methodical approach now before they can push forward. And BCG, like Wasserman Media Group and, and the other partners that Redbird and the XFL have, are involved in the process and helping assist. Yeah, and I, I'm fascinated by all of that because, uh, you know, how different for you is this league going to be, you know, with or without the Canadian Football League? From you know the last iteration of of the XFL and certainly the the first iteration in in two thousand and one because it's certainly you know I know a lot of people up here to me make the mistake of of kind of just throwing these groups all in there together but the reality is I mean you know this group with Redbird Capital and and Danny Garcia and the Rock had nothing to do with the previous incarnations right. uh, of the XFL so do, do you see many similarities in terms of what they did before and what they're going to do is this or is this going to be completely you know, different XF, it, yeah that's a very good point i think the xfl name itself has some positives and negatives to it and you know a lot of people you know associate the xfl name obviously with Vince man in 2001 a crazy league way back then and 2020 that league had a lot of goodwill and did a lot of great things for anybody who was paying attention in terms of the quality of play how immersive the broadcasts were um the gambling aspect where they would blatantly tell you about this point spreads during the game and prop bets and everything else. So there was a lot of innovations during that league. But I think what people are not kind of mentioning or focusing in on is although the XFL name is returning, even this very league, whatever it becomes, um, is going to be different from the 2020 version, which got positive reviews and did, did fairly well for a first year league in all aspects. So um, I think some, to some people, the name XFL has a, uh, negative perception, but um, in many ways, um, Danny Garcia, Dwayne Johnson, Redbird Capital, they're, kind of, they're starting over, and time has passed since the league, since the XFL was run, obviously in 2020 when the pandemic shut it down, um, that this league, while it will borrow some of the innovative concepts and elements, is going to be completely different than the, the league that existed in 2020. It's a different entity. You could argue whether or not they could have purchased the league and decided to rebrand it, um, go with a different name, and then maybe people would treat this uh, endeavor a little bit differently, I suppose. But um, but it's going to be an entirely different league with a different vision. Mike Mitchell joining us, XFL News Hub, CFL News Hub on the drive. And Mike, I mean, I would be one that would argue that they should have changed the name, but I do wonder, that's from a Canadian point of view, from an American point of view, what does the CFL name mean? I thought it was interesting when I say we, the CFL announced their season getting going, that there were headlines on ESPN about it. And uh, we've passed a single game betting in Canada where you're now provincial provinces are going to be able to kind of handle that on their own, but there will be single game betting now where there wasn't before. So what does the CFL name mean to most Americans? It's fascinating. It's a very good question. You know, like, for, for a lot of American-based football fans, the CFL, in my opinion, is wrongfully ignored. Um, um, I'm a fan and a supporter of alternative non-NFL leagues, and I've been a fan of the CFL my whole life, and I think the Canadian game is so much fun, um, so interesting, fast-paced. I love the width of the field. I love all the elements of the Canadian game, but I think for largely for the most part, the CFL is ignored or dismissed by the majority of mainstream football fans in America. I think it's great to see that very recently here with the CFL announcing its return that uh, the American side of things has like embraced their return. They're one of the leagues that went away, while these other leagues that are you know established leagues were able to still conduct business, albeit at a very reduced level. But the CFL, you know, was a league that had to shut things down for a year, and uh, I think everybody's happy that they're coming back. And I think there's going to be more interest in the CFL. Obviously, the Canadian side, Canadians are going to embrace the CFL uh, full throttle. You're going to, they're going to appreciate that they're back. Um, you know, but I think you're going to see some American fans sampling the CFL game, particularly those fans that are into 
leagues like the XFL, etc. And because of these talks, I think a lot of, I'm, I can speak frankly of all the people I've communicated with, a lot of people want to sample and find out about the CFL. What, what is this league like? And I think when they do sample it, they'll see how great of a league it is. So um, I, I think it's I think it's great for the CFL. I'm, I'm glad the league is coming back. It's unfortunate that so many players have moved on or retiring and all that, but I guess that's just part of the, the business. But um, I, I think I think the the gambling is going to help. There's no question about that. Uh, create more interest, and you know the CFL owners they realize that they're going to be operating at a loss this year financially. There's no way around that. But uh, just getting back up and running is important for their long term survival. So gambling and other things like that are going to help fuel them for the future. Mike, what's your sense on on cities? For, for the XFL going forward, do, do you think they go with the same eight that they were in? Is it a mix of some, you know, some of the better ones like like St. Louis and try to incorporate, you know, maybe an Oakland or, or a San Diego that lost NFL franchises? Any sense on where that's going to go? And how does this new USFL, which is, you know, right. kind of combined with the Spring League potentially, uh, how, how does that maybe put a wrench in, in, in the markets that they might want to go to? You know, what's fascinating is a lot of people don't know this, but the XFL, when it was reconstituted, I guess, in 2018 by Vince McMahon, the first two markets they looked at were Oakland and San Diego. But what ended up happening, well, the Oakland, there were some issues, there were venue and everything else, but what ended up happening was the Alliance of American Football rushed out and grabbed a lot of the markets that the XFL was looking to. The XFL decided it was going to do a two-year run-up to a season rather than rush into it. The AAF figured, here's our opening. And they went to a lot of the markets that don't have NFL franchises. Crazy enough, the AAF actually looked into uh, St. Louis, but they weren't able to work something out. The XFL pounced on St. Louis, and we saw how successful um, St. Louis was. The XFL embraced it fully, and they were going to have 40,000-plus as the season, uh, as far as fans in attendance as the season opened up. So they did really well there. From everybody I've spoken with, uh, involved in the XFL, they told me there might be some changes around the margin terms of the markets might be different locations in terms of where the teams play some of the teams played in larger stadiums i think it would benefit them to consider perhaps you know moving in la to a san diego or tampa maybe to orlando or a market that doesn't have uh, an nfl team i think that's to be consideration the venues have to be consideration as well you know you want to start off a first year league with a 90,000 seat stadium you can get 20 or 30,000 fans and that's excellent for a first year league to average that, but it just doesn't look right on television. It doesn't look great for the product from an aesthetic standpoint or from a perception standpoint. So I would tweak some things for sure. Um, St. Louis is definitely going to be a part of it. And I, I can totally understand Texas and Florida. In the United States, Texas and Florida are two of the best states for football, period. So having franchises in Houston or San Antonio or anything like that makes complete sense as, as, as well as as far as the elements go, weather. So, um, so, um, you know, because in February and, and if you're going to play in February, March, uh, it can be cold in certain cities. So I, I do think there'll be some tweaks. I don't know how much, though. But um, there were the fans embraced, the fans that they had in their markets embraced the teams, and I'm sure they'd love to see them come back, obviously, in St. Louis. You know, you mentioned the name of Vince McMahon. I can't help but think, like, I'm a big wrestling nerd, Mike, I'll tell you. And uh, I, I follow... AEW, a new company that has started up, and one of the greatest things that's ever happened to them is they got a collection of talent, but they got a national television, and they were able to, you know, disperse their product across North America very, very easily. I'll ask you the same thing about, you know, television in the United States and whether there's a market for it. Is there a market for another league to start up, you know, March, April, and run through August? in a, a CFL XFL merger that people in the sports industry would have an appetite to sign a national television deal for and what that might look like. That's a, another great question right there. Um, the way I'll say it is this, and I know this doesn't really compare, but the spring league who just had their season on Fox, they averaged 408,000 viewers per game. Now that doesn't sound great, right? But however, I'll say this, the landscape has changed so much that people are looking for live sports content, streaming partners and networks. When you look at that 408,000, that doesn't sound like much. But the NHL this past season averaged 391,000 viewers. I understand that's not an apples-to-apples comparison. And plus, the NHL was on NBC as well as the NBC Sports Network. So that number is skewer. They probably average close to 600,000 on network television. But for a football league to do 408,000 that has no promotion whatsoever – 
that's pretty impressive. Now, the XFL obviously dwarfed those numbers. They did much better. They competed with other uh, le- established leagues and did much better numbers, despite some of the perception out there that they didn't do well. They actually did very well for a first-year league. Um, that, uh, if you look at it in context, absolutely. But I think there is a market. Because if you look at it, if the NHL can average 391,000 viewers on those two entities that I just mentioned, and they just signed a contract with Turner and ESPN where I think ESPN is going to be giving them $400 million a year, uh, thereabouts. Um, so, and, uh, and Turner's also in that neighborhood. So they're getting quite a bit of money there. So it's come to the point now in the year 2021 where if you can deliver programming that has a guaranteed audience, I'm not saying that a startup league or a pro football league can get that kind of money. They can't. The NHL gets the money that they do for a reason. They're an established entity. These new leagues have to prove that they can survive and that they're going to be uh, established and, and solid. But I think if you can deliver a decent-sized audience in a landscape where there's so many viewing options, um, I think there's a chance for a football entity to uh, get a decent right deal. And I think, actually, it's a shame, but I think the XFL was headed towards that because they were doing good numbers on ABC Fox and ESPN. They were ranked in the top 10 in cable, and they were competing with other established leagues, NBA, NHL, etc. So um, sometimes beating them out, So which is crazy for a first-year league with teams that nobody knows and players that a lot of people don't know. So um, I think there is a market for it. I think, I think the quality of football player in 2021 is so much better now than it was 20 years ago because of the advancement of college football. So uh, I think programs are better, nutrition is better, I think uh, the college game mirrors the pro game uh, very much so, and vice versa. So um, I, I think there is a market for it. it the, the big question is, can you survive long enough to get to the point where you get TV rights money? Because running pro football leagues is very expensive. So um, you have to be willing to take some losses early on to experience games later. My last one for you, Mike, just on uh, the, the global presence and obviously this is something that Randy Ambrosi has tried to mine with CFL 2.0 you saw Danny Garcia uh, on the day that uh, that they announced uh, you know that they were talking about talking uh, you know with with the Canadian flag the US flag but you know the the global icon on there as well uh, we, we know they're going to try to uh, you know mine these these places uh, around the globe but can they take that next step right out of the gate and and have international franchises, maybe starting with, with Mexico. That would be amazing to have a team in Mexico or London or Germany. These are very good markets, obviously huge markets where there's potential there for uh, huge revenue streams, no question about it. I think the big thing with the CFL, and I understand where they're coming from, is while the game is great and all that, it's limited. There's only a certain amount of teams you can have in Canada. You can't expand to 20 or 30 teams. They could barely keep afloat the nine that they have. Um, so I, so in terms of expenses, so I can understand wanting to, um, create a larger pie. And part of that is expanding your reach internationally and introducing these other markets to the CFL game, making it accessible for them to watch the game. And then over time, you can build up your popularity where you can actually journey into those markets. I think it's a great pipe dream to have to think of franchises in, in Mexico, London, Germany, and all that, but I think that takes time to build to that point. If you, you could try, attempt to rush into it, but it's a costly endeavor, and the timing has to be right. Uh, I understand where the CFL is coming from in terms of there's there's a limit to how much uh, revenue streams they can create if they're just focused in on the nine markets in Canada. Um, Want to try to expand the game globally so you have more of a customer base, fan base. I know that's code for one of the, one and the same, but uh, the way the business people think, but. Um, I, I, I think the international expansion is a smart way to uh, expand your horizons. Well, and if you're looking for, as you said, you're talking about the television and you're looking to run it long enough to get established. Well, right. there's going to be the 109th Grey Cup here in December. Uh, this is a very established league. I guess my last one for you, Mike, is that, you know, we talked about the schedule and whether people would have an appetite Going along with that, I'm sure that players would look at it as, okay, is this a stepping stone to get to the NFL? And is it possible that they could play in this league and then get to the NFL with the schedule that would be laid out that's best for the product and television? Because I'm not sure that those two things match up. 
Yeah, and, it, and it, in the past, it did sort of match up in terms of, like, where the American leagues would situate their, their, you know, like, for example, the AAF would have their season from February until late April, and then players would be able to latch on to NFL teams after the draft, et cetera, et cetera. The XFL was doing the same thing. To the credit of those two leagues, they proved that there was talent out there because currently right now there are, I believe, 33 former XFL players on NFL rosters. And the AAF still has a good number, about 16 or 17 guys, young Hoku, who just uh, made the Pro Bowl with the Atlanta Falcons, or several other players. So um, I think the talent is out there. But your point about the calendar might shake things, shake things up a little bit. If there is an XFL, CFL, April to November, September, October, whatever type season, um, that window would make it a lot more difficult to, to head on over to the NFL. So that's definitely a factor. Um, I don't think that's a major concern for the XFL and CFL, but um, you know, players do play in these leagues, hoping that they can use these leagues as a window to get game film and prove how good they are, and get another opportunity in the NFL. Mm-hmm. So perhaps the uh, you know the change up of the calendar could affect that somewhat. Mike, thanks very much for your time. I think you've lent uh, a lot of insight to you know Canadians are very concerned about what the league is going to look like uh, past this year. So. Uh, we look forward to talking to you in the future, and uh, thanks very much for your time today. Thank you so much. I appreciate you guys reaching out, and um, I'm really happy and excited to see the CFL back in play. I'm looking forward to this season. Thanks, Mike. Really appreciate it. Thank you.